If you told me 10 years ago that I'd be speaking to you today about science, I would not believe that. If you look at my brain, you would definitely not find any science there, because uh, the only thing I knew about science was some scientists that I learned about from books and movies. <laughs> Uh, like the guy in the back who's coming from the future, and Richard Feynman and Einstein, and my idol, Francis Crick. I was a hacker. My job was to break into banks and financial institutions and steal money from them to show them how this was done so they can secure themselves better from the real bad guys. And I was good at it. It paid well, I enjoyed it, and I didn't think I was as good in anything else. One day, randomly, I ended up having dinner with a guest who visited my country, and which was Francis Crick, my idol. And you think that if you spend time having dinner with your idol, you're going to spend time mostly asking them questions about themselves, but the reality was different. All that happened was that the entire time, he wanted to know about me working as a hacker. This is all he cared about. He was a person who kind of was brought up during World War II, and like many others, like Alan Turing and others who worked as hackers and cryptographers during that time, and ended up after the the world, becoming scientists who changed the world, like discovered how DNA works. He was fascinated by hackers and he was sure that this is the future. And he told me, if you know how to look at a black box and see what comes in and what comes out and understand how the work of the box is, you should try looking at the most interesting black box of the world, our brain. Be a neuroscientist. It took me two years to listen to him, but when I actually did, I left my career in Israel and moved to Los Angeles to become a neuroscientist. Now, on my first day in school, I wrote a little note to myself with the type of questions that I felt were important to ask, things I don't, want, don't mind spending five years looking into. And those were questions from all walks of life. There were questions in physics about time traveling and aliens and biology. And the last question that I put there was whether humans have free will. Now, the reason I even asked this question started many years before, when I was a kid. I used to play a game that kind of informed my understanding of control. This game uh, was called uh, Donkey Kong. Uh, some of you seem to be familiar with that. It's a game where you play this little Italian plumber who tries to save his beloved princess up at the top of the building, and there's the vicious gorilla who throws barrels at you and tries to stop you from doing that. I was playing this game for a few seconds, doing pretty well, when suddenly two words appeared on the screen that changed my entire view of, of control. Those words were, insert coin. <laughs> because as it turned out, I wasn't playing the game at all. I was watching a movie, a demo of the game, and then it asked me to actually put money to play the game myself. But it did not feel this way. I was sure that I'm controlling the little character because I wanted to jump and it jumped and I wanted to move left and it moved left and sometimes probably I moved right and it moved left, but I didn't care. It seemed to me like I was in control. And this in many ways is a nice analogy for life. We live in our head, there's the body that moves us around, things happen to this body and we assume that if they happen to us, we must have wanted them. This is kind of how we wanted the world to be. But the reality is that sometimes we're not entirely in control. There's someone else in the past who makes decisions, and we kind of explain them in the present. Now, when I thought about that, I felt if there only was a way to run an experiment that actually shows this separation. And then I learned about the work of a guy in Sweden, Peter Johansson, who created a study that we could replicate in my lab that shows exactly that. So we bring people to the lab, and we have them play a simple decision-making game, a very simple. We show you two cards with two pictures of men, and we ask you to say, who do you find more attractive? That's the simplest choice. You don't have to think about that. So you might say, uh, the guy on the left. Then we give you the card that you picked, and we ask you to explain in one sentence why you picked that person. So you might say, I really like his smile. And we say, fantastic. Keep the card. Here's two new pictures. Pick again, who do you find more attractive? The guy on the right, here's the card, explain why. For about one hour, people just see those pairs of cards and make their choices. But there's a trick here. Because the guy in the back, the guy who hands you the card, isn't just a regular guy, he's a magician that we hired. And in some trials, he would give you the card you did not pick, the other card. Now, two inter interesting things happened. First, people never notice that the card they received wasn't the card that they asked for. But even more interestingly, they explained to us in one sentence why the card they received was the one they always wanted. How strange is that? You get something you didn't want, and you explain to me why this is what you always wanted, as if you go back in time in your mind and you change history to adjust to the current reality. 
This means that we can now use that to influence you in so many ways if you just kind of make you convinced that right now is what you always wanted. Imagine what it means for businesses, right? If, you, if I'm somehow making you, I put some item in your shopping cart as you walk in the supermarket, when you're going to get to the checkout, you're going to not only buy this thing, you're going to believe that you wanted it, and you're going to convince your friends that they should buy it too. How great is that? It means that we actually not only cannot know the future, we can't even know the past. This is like a fu future uh, fortune teller picture that I saw in San Francisco who reads the future, the past, and the present. How good is that? The reality is that in our brain, there's many mechanisms that sit there, and they decide together how to operate, but you only listen to the last person who speak. You don't know about all the others who spoke behind your back. So what I wanted to do was to somehow look in the brain at those little characters and see how you make a decision. Now, I knew that you can actually look at the brain in a very direct way if you open the brains of animals like mice, rats, monkeys. But when I came to Los Angeles, I learned about the work of one neurosurgeon, Itzhak Fried, who actually studies a very unusual animal called humans. Now, the way he does that is a very strange and uh, invasive way. He works with patients who have some kind of brain disorder that requires a surgery. Whatever problem they have requires them to open their brain, put electrodes inside their head, connect them to a computer, and keep them there for two weeks while surgeons wait for their problem to emerge, to manifest itself. So we can actually know what the problem is, fix it, take the wires out, close everything, and send the patient away fixed. But then, in the course of those two weeks, there's a person sitting in bed with open brain wires outside, just kind of watching TV, talking to his friends, reading books. So we can approach this guy and say, you know, you're already here. Your brain is already open. Do you mind maybe also uh, talking to me about your feelings and emotions, letting me look at your memories and see how you decide? People are happy to do that. And we can actually look at the brain and listen to cells in their own language. Now, if you were to open someone's brain and look inside, what you would see is a forest of little cells called neurons. And they speak in a little code that's electrochemical. But if we translate this code into sound, what you hear is something like that. Those spikes, those bursts of activity, is one cell speaking to another and telling it, I care about whatever happens in the world. So if we can put microphone in the brain and listen to each cell speaking, we can actually know what the person cares about by looking at the very way the brain speaks. So we do just that. We take patients, and we have them watch movies, like what you see here. Welcome and what you see here now is the sound of one cell in this woman's head while she watches those clips above. Try to see if you can figure out what this woman's cell cares about. What is the thing that makes this cell burst in activity in the world? Welcome to Wall Street and the New York Stock Exchange, the world's largest and surprisingly one of the... The Simpsons. This is one cell in this woman's head that comes to life when she sees the Simpsons. And if you know what the Simpsons are, you all have those cells in your brain that all kind of operated in orchestra right now when you saw these things. In fact, when I say Simpsons right now, it happens again. Simpsons. And we know that those cells aren't just coding the visual image of the Simpsons, but also the thought. Because what happens is that two hours later, a colleague of mine, Hagar Gelbert Sagiv, came back to the woman and told her now to just recall from her own mind with eyes closed the movies she's seen before. Now you see that the self of the Simpsons fires even when she just remembers in her own mind what we saw earlier. In fact, it fires two seconds before she speaks. This is memory in action. Now we see this woman's thoughts two seconds before she experiences them. When I speak to you right now, I feel that any word I, says, I say just comes out of my mouth. Right? I don't really think that I plan the next word. That's the slowest I've ever spoken in my life. Um, I just feel that the words come out of my, out of my mouth as I think them. I, I basically listen to myself just as much as you do. I kind of see what happens, but I don't really think that in my mind there's something that decides what I'm going to say two seconds before. And now that we find those cells in your brain, we see thoughts in action, we can actually move the electrodes in the brain and see all kinds of things. Like we can actually see how your brain processes visual information and makes decisions on what to see. So you all see this picture that's flickering right now, and I can tell you that your brain already has something that's not right in it. Your brain thinks something is weird here. It says something is there, and then it's not there. There and not there. You all think it's one picture, but it's actually it's two pictures that alternate. There's one thing that changes between the two pictures. 
Now you try to find it, but your brain already knows the answer. It just says to you, come on, let's see here. You can, you can already see that. And you try to say, okay, well, maybe it's the Canada flag on tail. Maybe it's the shadows of the soldier. You kind of confuse, so you start scanning the image from top to bottom, left to right, the blue sky. What could it be? Right at the center, the engine. You all see it now. Now the part of your brain that saw it right away, that was firing and silent, firing and silent, actually spoke to the you part of the brain and told it what's going on there. But what does it mean about our brain? That in our brain there's a part that knows something and doesn't talk to us? Who actually is the person to know those, those things in our minds? So I was interested in knowing that and I wanted to see if we can actually look at the part of the brain that disappears. We basically trace the decision in your mind to the point where you kind of become lost and see if we can see and play it maybe against you. So what we did is something like that. We created a box, a wooden box that has two buttons on it. And we put people to the lab, patients, and we told them you're going to play a simple game of decision making. You're going to decide whether you want to press the one on the left or the button on the right. That's all. A very simple choice. You're going to do it for half an hour just pressing buttons. But one thing, uh, whenever you press the button, we're going to uh, record the data from your brain. So we're going to need to save it. And we need to, need to make sure that you won't touch anything. So we're going to turn the lights on to indicate that we're saving data right now. So when the light is on, don't touch anything. It's important. When it's off, you can try again. That's all. So the patient sits there and looks at the button and starts playing this game. And we actually have the computer be the magician in this particular example. Because here, the trick is health. What we do is we have the computer find cells in your brain that code your decision to press the button. And once it found them, the computer basically does the following. It doesn't wait for you to know what time you want to press the button. It turns them on as soon as you decide it, just before you press the button. So it looks like that. The person sits there and about to press a button, and the lights turn on just right away. And now, we get very angry at him. We told him, what did you do? We told him, no, one thing not to do. Do not press the button when the light's already on. I'm so sorry, doctor, it didn't mean to. It kind of happened by itself. Never mind, just don't do it again. And again, he tries to do it, and it happens again. How weird will that be? How weird is the world when anything you want to do happens before you do that? You know, they try to do it faster. They try to kind of trick us by going to the right and left. But there's no trick here. We're in their mind. As soon as they know, I know. How weird is a world where everything you know happens just before you do it? Imagine you go to a restaurant and you want to kind of make a choice and there's 10 items in the menu and you say in your mind, I want to choose the lasagna. And before you say, the waiter says, oh, just one thing, we're out of lasagna. Say, so, oh, stranger, I was going to say, never mind, I'm going to choose the, uh, oh, right, there's no more salad. Oh, I was going to say salad. And as soon as you want to make choices, they disappear. Well, we can trick you and play your mind against you behind your back, but it can also help you. We can actually put the electrodes in places in your brain that you normally don't get access to and actually help you control things in your mind that you normally cannot control. When we see the world, it's already in color. If we try hard, we can, eat, we can still not make the world be in black and white, even though our brain at some point processes color. So we can actually put the electrodes where vision is and help you see things that are not there or that are there. When, when you see, you don't see with your eyes, you see with your mind. So I can put a picture of Marilyn Monroe in front of your eyes, have you look at it, but teach you, using the electrodes, how to see with your mind something else, like Michael Jackson. Just override the information from your senses with the mental inside your brain. You can all do that if you already have electrodes in your head. So we can do that, we can also help you control your emotions, right? Also in your brain, there are your feelings. And normally they just kind of dawn on us. We don't really say, I want to be sad and become sad and kind of be sad for a minute and then we say, enough, I'm going to be happy now and become happy. It kind of happens to us even though it's in our head. So now we can move the electrode to where emotions are and actually help you control your feelings by teaching you how to regulate up and down your emotions. We can take people with trauma and actually help them learn to navigate and control their own emotions. This is pretty cool, and we can do all kinds of fancy stuff. We can move the electrodes to anywhere in your brain, including the part where you make decisions, like decisions that are irrational. We all know that psychology says that people are not good in making decisions, but what does it help them? They still are not good. Now we can actually move it to the part of the brain that actually is good in some things and help you be better in making rational decisions when you need rational decisions. Or we can even go there to the part that's really buried up inside and see your dreams. Now, dream is an interesting thing because when this work came out five years ago, it was nothing to do with dream. It was just about seeing people's thoughts and projecting them on a screen. But I got a call from BBC Nightly News and they said, you know, we watched your work, it's fantastic. What can be done with that in the future? And I said, in the future, there's all kinds of things. You can actually look at people's intentions and memories and even dreams. And the guy said, wait, what do you mean dreams? I said, well, in theory, you can see people's dreams. He said, oh my God, it's amazing, and hang up the phone. 
And then I realized what I just said, and I said, well, not a big deal. It's not going to be the end of the world. But the headline BBC the night of was Dream Recording Device Possible Researcher Claims. Well, I did say it, but who's going to pick up on that? Turns out, everyone. Because five minutes later, NBC opens with the headline, scientists hope to record our dreams after successful experiment using brain implants. And five minutes later, uh, time has forget inception. Try extraction, dream recording is possible. And before long, the entire media out there was full of headlines about the scientists who can record your dream. And I tried my best to make it clear that it's not what we do, and it's impossible, but it didn't help, because everyone thought this is what I do. In fact, there was a chef calling me and asking me to uh, get him a recipe that's in his dreams, but he can't really get it out there. And some Apple computer called me uh, and said that they want to put it in the next operating system, and there was a, a Wikipedia page for the dream recording machine, and a price and a spec. Everyone was talking about this amazing thing that was, in fact, not really possible. But the trick here is something else. My mistake wasn't in saying that something is possible when it was not. It was actually the opposite, trying to stop that. Because three years later, I got a call from BBC again, and they said, we're going to talk to you about the dream coding machine again. And I said, are you kidding me? We've already been through it. It's not true. Leave it. They said, no, no, we know that you cannot do that. But the guys in Japan who just published a paper that do just that. Turns out that three years after I said it's impossible, after claiming that it's possible, someone just did that. And what I learned from that is that science is about the impossibilities. Every time I now say that something is impossible, I actually stop myself and say, wait, it's just impossible now, maybe in three years. Because science fiction is about that. The scientist who informed me when I was a kid, the game that I played as a child, actually made me who I am today. In 1985, the movie, they actually jump to 2015, the year we're at right now. I grew up on that movie, on these scientists. They informed who I am. And in many ways, I operate by the rules of those people, the people who kind of became who I am today, a scientist. And in fact, I told you in the beginning that I didn't imagine I'm going to be here 10 years ago thinking that I'm going to be a scientist, but it's not really true, because when I looked before this talk at my elementary school book, I found that my friends in school wrote, yes, he studies ballet dancing and clown and, and juggling and all kinds of things, but we all think he's going to be a professor. And they even drew a cartoon picture of me with red nose, but also drawing as a professor. So maybe, maybe you can actually look at my brain and see far before something that hints at the possibilities out there. The reality is that in our brain we have many, many voices speaking, and we only listen to the last one who speaks, ignoring all the others because they're more introverts, more quiet, but they come up when we dream, when we are uh, thinking a little more longer about things. And if we learn to listen to them, we're actually going to do better in making choices, living life, making businesses better, and actually living in a world that's more accurate to who we are. But there's a trick here, too. And the trick here is that it requires us to accept the fact that we're not the center of the universe. And there's a nice analogy here that I always like to tell my students about. This is an analogy from 400 years ago. When Galileo Galilei pointed his telescope to the moons of Jupiter and looked out there, he saw that they orbit in a different way than he expected them to do. He was baffled by that, but then the only solution was to understand that actually the Earth is not the center of the universe, but the sun is. And once we moved Earth to not be the center, this seemed first like a dethronement of humankind. What does it mean that we're not the center of the universe? But actually, it allowed us to explore the wide reaches of the world and get farther than we ever imagined. In the same way, we understand right now that we're not the center of our own little universe, that there's other voices in our head that control who we are. This seems to us very nerve-wracking to understand that we might not be the only person speaking on our behalf. But the reality is that once we get that, we can actually explore the most interesting thing in the universe which is us. Thank you.